Hello and good afternoon and welcome to the Institute of International and European Affairs. First, can I say to anybody who had planned to join us live in the office in North Great Georgia Street, we just had to take a technical decision this morning that it was better not to put anybody at risk and we decided to make the whole meeting uh, online so that every, everybody could join in. So you're very welcome today. Today we have um, a talk uh, entitled The Shadow of Famine, How the Food Crisis is Impacting the Horn of Africa and Beyond. So I just a few housekeeping things. You can put your questions in during the, uh, the speech and um, you use the, the little um, message on your on the bottom of your screen. You can also send in uh, messages at IIEA. And I'd like if you gave your name and if you're part of an organization, that would be a help as well. Um, the minister will speak for about uh, 20 minutes or so, and then we will have a time for questions. Now, today we are very, very pleased indeed, just back from, from a lot of travel to have with us Colin Brophy, Minister of State for Development Aid. And some of you will know that this is an area of policy that I had a great involvement with when I was in the Dáil. I chaired the Development Aid Committee for about seven years and did quite a bit of traveling to the various African countries where we were at that stage only associated with four countries. Now I think it's nearly the whole continent of Africa. But Colin was appointed Minister of State with responsibilities for overseas development and the diaspora in July 2020. He's a Fine Gael TD representing Dublin Southwest and was elected to the Dáil in 2016. He served as chairman of the Budgetary Oversight Committee, which was one of the most important committees established in Leinster House. And he was also a member of the Committee of Justice and Equality and the Committee of European, for, uh, European Affairs. He was a former member of South Dublin County Council, and he's a former member of the board of the Housing Agency. And he's also a former president of the Association of Irish Local Government. Well, that's some CV column, very impressive indeed and I'm sure it's being looked at very closely now and um, we are very glad today that we are going to first be introduced to Colm through Michael Gaffey who is a very senior official are you Secretary Gen Deputy Secretary General Michael you can tell us that I've forgotten ex your exact title uh, Michael Gaffey again is an old pal of mine he was in charge of the Women Peace and Security Committee which I still chair and he's come back from Geneva and he's now very senior in the Department of Foreign Affairs. So I'm going to hand the, the, um, the chair over to you, Michael, to open the proceedings, and then you can hand on to Colm. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nora. And um, that's enough about, enough about me. But I will say about you, Nora, that I certainly am really aware of your lifelong commitment to the issues of development and, and humanitarian assistance. Uh, and so it is really great to see you chairing this uh, very important discussion because we really, despite all the progress that we've made on development, we're at a particular moment now of great challenge where there are a series of interlocking crises, uh, humanitarian crises, food security crises, development crises, and peace and security crises, which require us to consider how we work more effectively especially through our uh, development aid uh, program. And uh, I have been back in this role since the start of September. And the very first thing I did was accompany uh, the minister on his visit to the Horn of Africa, which he is going to speak about. And I, I just want to say that um, Ireland has, since that visit, played a very strong role internationally in highlighting this crisis which, if it weren't for Ukraine, would be on our screens every day of the of, of the month. Um, and we have done so also with the benefit of increased funding directed to that crisis. So Ireland is playing a strong international role. And I'm very glad to say that it is being led by a very strong minister with a very strong personal commitment to working on this crisis and guiding us in how we can be more effective in our work. And with that, I just will hand over to that minister, Colin Brophy, uh, so that you can hear his statement. Minister, I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Michael. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Michael. And, uh, and a particular thank you, Nora, uh, for your, your, your opening remarks. I was actually, uh, two things I suppose to say in relation to them. First of all, as you went through it, I was beginning to realize 
that I've been around a long while. <laughs> it's when you start when you start hearing the list, uh, it suddenly dawns on you. And uh, and obviously the second thing is just to say that I've known you for for so many years and always have been so impressed by the work you've done in this area. Indeed, it had a big influence in, in my interest in the area um, when um, I was uh, starting out. Um, so just having said that, um, obviously to say thank you to the IIEA for organizing the meeting. Um, the current crisis in the Horn of Africa, I think deserves all our attention. Um, and as was mentioned by both Nora and Michael, it, it needs to be treated, I believe, with far more urgency and determination by the international community than it has been to date. Um, one of the principal motivations for my recent visit to Kenya and South Sudan was I wanted to increase both the domestic and the international attention that I knew was um, you know, needed in what is basically a, a dire and rapidly deteriorating humanitarian crisis. Um, I always say that if we get to a point where we have television cameras, as we had in the 1980s, when we remember back around the Live Aid turning up, if they are filming those images, that is actually failure because we don't need to reach that point. We can intervene now. And that's a lot of what I want to talk about today. So I want to talk about the overall scale of the crisis, which is staggering. There are 36 million people affected by five seasons of drought in the Horn of Africa. That's focused particularly on Ethiopia, on Somalia and Kenya. There's over 21 million face acute levels of food insecurity and malnutrition. The current estimates predict that the figure will go as high as 26 million by next February. Hundreds of thousands of people, particularly in Somalia, are already experiencing famine-like conditions and having seen in northern Kenya what I saw firsthand, that is absolutely the case. I knew the situation was grave. What I witnessed was even worse. The region is facing a series of what I call an interlocking crisis. So there's drought and climate change. There's global and regional conflict. And there is unsustainable food systems. The devastation is being wrought on vulnerable communities, mostly across the Horn of Africa, as a result of this confluence of factors. And it's really hard to overstate. The people facing starvation, who have been forced to flee their homes and to abandon all their lives, and the impact this is having them. Now, in addition to the drought, and it's almost counterintuitive to say that some regions are experiencing wide-scale flooding year after year. I saw firsthand when I went to bed to in South Sudan, where UN camps house those who've had to flee the large scale climate induced floods that ravaged the region over the past several years. Traveled in from Juba, I could see the small, tiny, fragile dikes that are holding back vast expense of water that's actually threatening to wipe out these makeshift camps. And as I was told firsthand, one of the tragedies of it is, is the rain didn't even fall in their region. It fell far away and the floods came down. Uh, to this area. So they, they got no benefit out of the actual rain. They just got the floods. This contrasted, though, completely with what I'd seen in Turkana in northern Kenya. There, the communities are completely stricken by drought. Um, they told me at that stage when I visited that they were really sad and worried and terrified that the rains would fail again. Now, unfortunately, that has happened. And the humanitarian catastrophe that is now ahead of us is like nothing we have seen, I believe, in many, many decades. I spoke to a man in Turkana, and he really had an impact on me in terms of what he said. He pointed out that their animals are dead, the trees under which they were sitting are dying, and he feared that he and his children would be next. And that's an incredibly powerful thing to hear said to you firsthand by a community leader who's going through this literally in front of your eyes. In a nearby health clinic, I also met with mothers who had severely malnourished children, literally children too ill to cry. The malnutrition rates in those clinics have doubled since February, and they continue to, work, they continue to get worse as the drought continues. But in addition to the immediate humanitarian crisis, 
were also watching the eradication of a way of life. Cattle were the main source of food and income for pastoral farmers in this region. Over the course of my visit, I did not see any, not one, left alive. In Kenya alone, they estimate that 1.5 million animals have died due to drought. For millennia, the people of Turkana relied on their livestock for survival. It's just no longer tenable. The people of Turkana, and many million more, are going to have to find new ways to live. The primary driver of these environmental crises is undeniably climate change. This is climate change happening now. Average annual temperatures in the region are increasing at almost double the global rate. There's changing weather patterns, there's environmental degradation. It's having a huge impact. It's shaping conflict cycles. It's impacting on food production. It's threatening livelihoods. And it's literally wiping out ways of life. Small scale farmers who produce more than 80% of the world's food in Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa Africa are completely disproportionately affected by this climate change. So if you take the climate induced shocks, which are obviously intertwined with the unsustainable food systems, which continue to deteriorate, this crisis shows no, no signs at all of ending, just of getting worse. You add to that new and ongoing conflicts, political tension, global impact, particularly ironically of the war in Ukraine, which continues to undermine the global food production and food security, which has really exacerbated the situation. So the actual, as people might be aware, role which Ukraine and Russia played in the export of food and the impact of that war, therefore, has had a considerably exasperated situation. In Sudan, for example, where a military coup last year halted the democratic transition, that was underway, about 40 million people are experiencing high levels of food insecurity. That's phase three or worse. While the food crisis has been felt across the region, the drought in the Horn is having perhaps the most acute effects. Although we've not yet had an official declaration of famine, the reality in parts of Somalia and elsewhere is that famine is there and should be responded to as such. And believe me, when you see it firsthand, it is a famine. It is important to remember that what we are seeing in the Horn is one of the worst manifestations of today's global crisis. But world hunger and acute insecurity are escalating. Humanity needs are at an all time high. And we also obviously have severe food price inflation. The number of people in the world facing hunger began to increase in 2019. The figures are stark. In 2021, that number reached 828 million, 828 million. By the end of 2022, at least 222 million across 52, 53 countries will be facing acute food insecurity and in need of urgent assistance. Starvation, is a real and very real risk for 45 million people in 37 countries. The global rise in food insecurity is also exacerbating what was already a severe humanitarian situation in West Africa, one of the most fragile and conflict affected regions. So you have 34.5 million people facing food insecurity in Sahal and Lake Chad Basin where violence, obviously linked to extremist armed groups and intercommunal conflict, is resulting in an appalling numbers of civilian deaths and fueling the political instability and the humanitarian crisis. And it's something we need to be so conscious of the fact that that food insecurity will fuel political instability, will fuel all the conflict situations. The unfolding humanitarian catastrophe, though, is particularly disproportionately affecting women and children. Currently, only one in five young children in the Sahel receive the minimum number of required food groups. This is reflective of the tragic fact that always children bear the highest burden of malnutrition globally. An estimated 45 million children under the age of five were suffering from wasting last year. That figure, I believe, well, for me anyway, is hard to comprehend. Even more so when you actually consider that child wasting is entirely preventable. 
But as I witnessed in health clinics in Northern Kenya, it is a very real and sad reality. There's just a narrow window of opportunity to prevent an even greater crisis. And widespread famine in parts of Somalia, South Sudan and Ethiopia. Humanitarian agencies and partners have appealed for 3.4 billion to provide assistance to respond to the drought. Unfortunately, that appeal is only 55% funded, 55% funded, severely limiting humanitarian agencies' capacities to respond and save lives. It's vital that the international community responds urgently to prevent large scale starvation and death. And as I said earlier on, remember when the cameras turn up, it's the definition of failure, it's too late. So apart from this being our responsibility as those citizens, it's also our responsibility as developed countries. The drought is a direct result of climate change and we cannot ignore the role that developed countries have played in causing this. Kenya produces, and this is, I think, just one of the great ironies. Kenya produces one two thousand of global CO2 emissions. However, at the same time, almost 75% of the power in Kenya comes from renewable resources. The countries in the Horn did not create the crisis, and they should not be expected to manage the costs and the consequences alone. Now, Ireland is definitely playing its part. Following my visit, I'm very glad that the government announced we'd provide an additional 30 million in immediate humanitarian assistance to respond to the urgency of the crisis across the region. That's on top of the 3.2 million in additional humanitarian aid that we dispersed in October, including 1.5 million to the Irish NGOs active on the ground and 500,000 for UNICEF's work with malnourished children in Kenya. It brings Ireland's total support in the Horn of Africa this year to over 100 million. Now, working through the trusted partners on the ground, obviously, including the UN agencies and the Irish NGOs, Ireland's funding will support the most vulnerable communities right across the most severely affected countries in the region. These partners have been chosen on a proven geographic and sectoral and because of the thematic expertise and their capacity to deliver effective timely responses to the needs of those worst affected by the crisis. The focus will be on life saving health, nutrition and water and sanitation and cash responses will align with Ireland's commitment always to be reaching those furthest behind first. But we'll place a strong emphasis on supporting local humanitarian efforts. Special attention will be paid to the plight of women and girls who I mentioned earlier, who've been disproportionately affected, um, obviously by the drought, and to ensure that their needs are met. This additional funding from Ireland complements support already provided through other channels including the multilateral agencies and the pooled funds of OCHA and the Central Emergency Response Fund, SURF, which has been central to the response in the Horn of Africa. We've already, and I was already, SURF has already provided 143 million in 2022. And Ireland is among the top 10 donors to SURF. We provide 11.5 million annually there. Now, while our immediate priority is to save lives, Ireland's funding will also begin to lay the groundwork for longer term resilience and development that will empower those left furthest behind to withstand the inevitable shocks that come. And I think it's really important because we have in the last number of years really allied both our immediate response with our development commitment because it is such an important way of helping not just to save people in an initial response but to empower those communities. So in, the, in Somalia, for example, a million pound contribution from Ireland to the International Fund for Agricultural Development is boosting the agricultural productive capacity, the food supply chains, the irrigation and domestic water supply. I saw firsthand on my trip how just by using a targeted approach to help farmers who had been pastoral to grow crops, you can enable a community to stay where it is and to actually start to grow the food that is necessary to sustain them in a longer term. In September 2022, at the high level event in New York at the UN with USAID Administrator Samantha Power, Ireland pledged 50 million to fight acute malnutrition over the next three years. 
This is in addition to our pledge to provide over 850 million over five years on nutrition programs and interventions. Supporting partners working in the Horn of Africa and indeed in West Africa will be a key focus of this response. Coordination across the nexus of humanitarian development and peace actions is now more important than ever. In the Horn, we recognize that humanitarian funding alone will not be sufficient to address the complex challenges facing the region and our development program will also look to target the underlying causes and the drivers of conflict, that's instability and food insecurity in a region. We will prioritize actions targeting gender equality, strengthening governance and climate action, as well as maintain a focus on food insecurity and malnutrition. Our humanitarian action complements our robust political intervention to protect civilians and resolve conflict. This includes obviously our engagement at the UN Security Council over the last 10 years, where we've actually taken a very strong leadership role on peace and security in the Horn, including chair of the Somalia Sanctions Committee. We've also been to the fore on the Council's engagement on Ethiopia, where two years of conflict in the north of the country had a really devastating impact on civilians. The peace agreement reached between the Ethiopian government and the Tigray authorities last month, I believe was a really important step towards peace for the country. However, implementation of all aspects of that agreement will now be the key. And the immediate focus must remain on ensuring humanitarian access to all those in need. Ireland has prioritized some of the key drivers of the current crisis in the Horn throughout our term on the Security Council. Through our work on hunger and climate at the Security Council, I believe we've galvanized international attention to the underlying causes of food insecurity, including conflict and climate. And we continue and will continue and continue to need to do that even after we finish our term on the Security Council. As you will be aware, the budget in 2023 that the government provided here provided over 1.2 billion for international development. This is an increase of 18% on our 2022 and represents an unprecedented investment in Ireland's overseas development programme. Of this, 75 million will be focused on humanitarian and other needs in Ukraine and in countries affected by the impact of Russia's invasion. And those countries obviously include the Horn of Africa. An additional 25 million will be provided as part of the government's commitment to more than double our climate finance per year by 2025. Most of this will be channeled towards adaptation activities for vulnerable countries, including those in the Horn. Linked to this, I'd like to highlight the role played by Ireland at COP in reaching a historic outcome on the priority issue of loss and damage. Ireland held the key position of lead EU speaker on loss and damage, and indeed my colleague Eamon Ryan taking the leading political role within the EU to help negotiate the agreement during COP. And when you think back and you think about loss and damage to the figures I gave you in terms of what, say, Kenya's contribution uh, to emissions is, that is why loss and damage is so important. The agreement includes the establishment of financing arrangements for loss and damage, obviously, including a new fund. And importantly, the outcome also includes key provision which will enable the fund to target developing countries that are most vulnerable to climate change. The focus of my visit to COP was on how Ireland's international development program and climate finance supports resilience and adaptation to climate change in developing countries. I announced a funding package of 5 million for climate adaptation and resilience, with targeted focus on the least developed countries and the small island developing states. I also highlighted Ireland's support for climate resilient food systems and announced a further 14 million over three years uh, to, to support research and development, particularly in food and agricultural systems, including strengthening climate resilience in this sector. Ireland continues to work through the EU to address the crisis in the Horn of Africa. On the 20th of June, the Foreign Affairs Council endorsed the Team Europe pledge for over 600 million for the Horn of Africa. An additional package of emergency aid for the region was recently announced by the EU as part of the new 210 million effort to address food insecurity in the 15 countries. 
It's welcome, but we still need to be doing more. I would like to conclude by going back to why I am so appreciative of your focus today. One question that I regularly get asked is, what more can we do? Whether that be as Ireland, or as the international community, or even just as, it, as concerned citizens. To answer that question, I want to go back a little bit to that man in Turkana that I mentioned earlier. When talking about what else he wanted from us, he didn't ask for more money, which I thought was really interesting. He didn't ask for more resources. He wanted for me, for the people who had come, to make sure that people knew what was happening and to be a voice for them. He asked just that one thing to make sure that people hear what is happening, hear what I have said to you and to be a voice for us. Right now, it is really important that we all use our voices in whatever way possible, through whatever channels we have to urge the international community to step up. This is the message that I heard repeatedly when I was in the region, both speaking to those directly affected by the crisis, as well as indeed by the UN, by NGO workers on the ground. In South Sudan, humanitarian actors that I spoke to stressed the need to make sure that South Sudan does not become a forgotten crisis. And that was, I thought, interesting because they really wanted to make that point. I was there just around the time the floods were happening in Pakistan, and they were so conscious of the fact of what was happening in South Sudan and that it was almost completely lost to the world. 8.3 million people, over 75% of the population, are experiencing severe food insecurity. I mean, it is an incredible dire situation and it is almost completely and utterly going without mention anywhere. We must step up our emergency humanitarian response. We must listen to the voices of those urging us to address head on the underlying drivers of the crisis, including how the approaches to global economy and politics are exacerbating and having a devastating impact in some cases on climate change, on unsustainable food systems and on conflict on the ground. The crisis is far too big for any one country to tackle alone. Far too big, not just for a country the size of Ireland, it's far too big even for members of the G7 or the elite countries of the world. It requires the whole international community to commit itself to show resolve in responding to the immediate needs and in addressing the root causes. So when this time, when we hear it said never again, we actually mean it. So before I conclude though, I want to also stress that across the Horn of Africa, there are actually some positive signs of hope. Elections took place in Somalia in May that resulted in a peaceful transfer of power. The new government actually seems set on improving relations with its neighbours and in tackling the threats posed by Al-Shabaab and is engaging really constructively with the international community. In Sudan, an agreement was reached between military authorities and civilian representatives that may, and we hope again, lead to a restoration of the democratic transition. In Kenya, the recent presidential elections and the transfer of power that also took place peacefully. And finally, in Ethiopia, as I've mentioned, the brutal conflict that resulted in hundreds of thousands of casualties, a peace agreement was reached last month. And that's holding, hopefully, and will allow, obviously, that humanitarian need and assistance that's needed to begin to reach those. So countries on the ground are playing their part, and there are positive things to be seen there. It is important that we continue to play ours. Ireland will remain steadfast in our commitment to tackling the immediate and substantial needs in the Horn of Africa, while also continuing to advocate for sustainable solutions that address the underlying drivers of the crisis. There is still a chance to avoid the worst case scenario, to avoid the crisis. As I say at the start, and I'll conclude by saying it, if we wait till the cameras turn up, to fill in the scenes that we've seen before, that will be failure. We can avert that, we can stop that happening, but we must do so by acting urgently and acting now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Minister, for that very comprehensive 
uh, report, sadly, mostly with very bad statistics, very bad news in it. I was particularly um, hit by one expression you used, um, wiping out way of life. And I was reminded of Ireland when COVID hit and we were all very frightened. We didn't know what was going to happen. And it did begin to wipe out certain forms of life that we enjoyed. But we had a government and we had the money, thankfully, to put inputs in to prevent the worst fallout from the COVID. But in the countries you've been speaking about, they don't have the resources or if they do, they're not being properly spent. There is a lot of corruption. And I'm glad that you finished on a, on a more positive note that some of these countries now are making an effort maybe to move on from some of the bad practices and the bad corruption and um, leadership that they have had. And we have to face that reality. But the, the figures are frightening. And I, I did a quick calculation. 38 years, 1984, when I went to Ethiopia um, and the terrible famine was on there. And then we saw a great lift in Ethiopia, became very positive, and we were really very confident about its future. And here we are again talking about Ethiopia. And I know many of the people watching this webinar will be working in NGOs, will be working in the concerns, Trocra's goals, Christian aids, you know, that are trying their best to make life a bit better. But thank you for that comprehensive a report. I'm going to start with a question and I have some questions coming in as well. Question here from Keelan, our researcher. Um, Last Friday, I think the UN Security Council adopted a resolution, which, of course, Ireland was part of the co-drafting team uh, with the United States to create a carve out across UN sanctions regimes that protects humanitarian assistance and meets human basic needs. Do you think this is critical and will it work? Because what we see too often is that great promises are made, but there doesn't seem to be any sanction against the countries that don't live up to the promises. So I just wonder how you feel about that resolution now that we are nearly ending the term of our UN. Well, I, I, I think very positive towards, I think it, it is important that we look at how we engage on these levels because we need to have a carrot and stick. We need to have an approach um, that enables us to implement and we need there to be a consequence for non-implementation. So I'm conscious of the fact that we're moving on that. Um, and I think that's a very positive thing for us to be engaged on. Thank you very much. I mean, it, it is important that we continue to play a role and we certainly do play a role. We have a voice. It's, I think you've said that, Minister, several times. And we have a voice that's far bigger than our size. And oh, I've seen that over very the years. Much so. it, it, yeah. it, very much so. I mean, one of the really positive things about our engagement uh, with the UN is that while, yes, our term will come to an end, we have worked in such a positive way with a number of countries um, that the impact and benefit it will continue beyond our term there's a lot we can continue to work on and do there's a lot of roles we can continue to play and it's a particular viewpoint and an approach to how aid should work and run that we do and that we brought to the UN in terms of our membership of the Security Council but I believe we can continue to influence and it's very much about um, the ethics of what you do reaching the furthest behind and putting in place the structures, particularly for me, one of the, the key things is around the, the, the peace and security side, and also ensuring that humanitarian and development response um, by international agencies is linked. So as that you don't, as I mentioned in, in my contribution earlier on, that you don't just see them as separate, but you actually put in place the supports for a community after the immediate crisis response to enable them. Because to go back to the point you said earlier on, uh, Nora, in terms of, um, you know, if, if you have thousands of years of a way of life being wiped out, mm -hmm. you have entire communities being devastated. What you are going to end up is if you don't support them to actually be able to continue to live in a new world in a different way, 
with maybe agricultural supports and new food systems, then you're going to see mass migration and mass movement. And whether that's internally within their own country, whether it starts to cross international borders, all of it has the potential to generate conflict. All of it has the potential to be incredibly destabilizing, both to the governments and regional authorities in the area where it starts and the areas where they where people end up. So from so many aspects, both the immediate response and the development response are absolutely crucial in terms of what we're doing. I mean, there, there can be at times people critical of the number of people who land in Ireland or in Europe looking for, for um, asylum and refugee status. But you have to go back to what we've been listening to you saying to see where that starts. And so in a way, it's in our interest to try and help people to stay in their own countries, earn a living, bring up their children. Now, I have a question here from Gerald Ahern. Yes, I can I just make one, yes. just one small point on that, Nora, that's, yeah. that's really important is to remember that only a tiny percentage of people actually end up in countries like Ireland. Mm -hmm. The real crisis is caused by movement which has people moving within either their own country. I mean, in South Sudan, I saw two sets of camps side by side. The people who've been living for over a decade in internally displaced person camps, living in absolute dire conditions, now being joined by people who are living in camps next to them because of the climate crisis. But both of those communities have had their entire way of life shattered and have ended up having to live in these conditions because of both in one instance climate and another instance conflict and the real impact is felt very often in either the home country or in the neighboring countries where the vast majority of people end up yes and you have people moving from one very poor country, country to, to another. another very poor country looking for help there Absolutely. i've seen i've been in those camps and and i know and i know they just bring tears to your eyes when you see the conditions can i go on to some questions here minister if you don't mind i have one from gerald hearn who i know is a former a former army officer and a member of the iaea he says kenya is significant exporter of agricultural produce particularly fruit and vegetables to europe is it overdue for Ireland to challenge the Kenyan government to divert those exported cash crops to help feed its own citizens? Now, that's an interesting question. Well, there's always a balance to be, look at, to be looked at in terms of what a country is actually doing and what its food requirements are. And actually, the Kenyan government is very good at working on the new Kenyan government has been particularly good at implementing very quickly programs to try and address the need for um, revitalizing um, the, the, the whole system of agriculture in the country, looking at how food security can be maintained, looking at how you continue, because countries need to continue to trade. I mean, in the longer term, a country's ability to trade is hugely important towards its ability to deal with crises like this, but also provide food solutions uh, to people on the ground. That's why they're working with the international community on some of the schemes I was talking about, where they're enabling and developing agriculture, different forms of agriculture in affected regions. So while I can fully understand that it might seem the most obvious thing to say, right, well, why are you exporting when, at the same, when, when you have people uh, who are hungry in your country? I think it is a much more complex solution, which involves how you handle the resources and I think what the Kenyan government in particular is doing is working with Ireland and working with uh, the UN and working with the international agency, the NGO, to make sure that the right food solutions are provided to, to tackle the crisis we're facing into. But they can't do it alone. Overnight, if they, if they stopped probably exporting every single item of food, mm -hmm. that doesn't solve the problem in the Horn of Africa. It doesn't even solve the problem in Kenya. This is a much bigger international problem that is a multi-billion pound response that's required that is vastly beyond what a local Kenyan government or any local government in the region can do and we need to actually recognize that that our real solutions to this is how you actually tackle in the immediate the crisis and then how you put in place which is something by the way Ireland has really worked on is enhanced and new food security uh, that enables the country to be able to not get caught in this again. Yes, thank you. I think this next question from Philip McDonough might be along that lines. He says, are there technologies that can help communities in East Africa to transition to new lifestyles? Does this imply a link 
to what he has in inverted commas, regenerative agriculture in the European Union. I know when in many of my visits to Africa, I saw kind of improvements in how you cope with agricultural growing, you know, using the dead leaves of other plants to keep water in the ground and that sort of thing. So really what Philip is asking is, are there technologies that you think we should be um, using and that the African states should be getting hold of? Absolutely. And I mean, the situation is this, that thankfully Ireland is to the forefront of this in, in cooperation projects between both universities and between Chagaskan uh, and agencies on the ground. It is really important that developed Western countries recognise that for everybody's sake, uh, food security and the way in which we do agriculture has to change, has to change radically. And there is absolutely solutions that can be worked on and can be developed. As I mentioned earlier on, just down to a very simple thing I saw on the ground due to taking in the technology, which is the type of technology that used to be used to try and find oil, to using that uh, in a converted way to find sources of water, which are deep sources of water, which can then be tapped into and brought to the surface, which will work in an arable situation so in other words the growing of crops which can then feed a community that can enable that community to continue to live in a local area um, the old style of farming which was predominant in the horn of africa was a pastoral based farming which effectively involves the wide-scale roaming of cattle and goats and in some instance camels um, it, it, that just won't work anymore. There, there, there isn't surface level water. There isn't a climate anymore that can sustain it. But we can and should be doing everything we can to put in place the food systems through technology that's already there, but which is beyond obviously the ability of countries, or not to mention local people, to afford. Uh, to put in place the new food systems that will enable them to feed mm -hmm. themselves. There is no point in having a it, a, a disconnected response which saves or stops an emergency but then leaves people effectively no better off and on the verge of famine yet again in almost an immediate period of time yeah. it's what i what i have described and uh, as literally taking people back from a cliff edge by asking them to step back two steps and then leaving them there that is not a solution. The solution has to be both. We must deal with the emergency and then provide the longer term solution. Because if you don't, you will either end up with mass migration and the potential for conflict leading to further problems, or you will end up with a community back at the verge of famine yet again. Yeah, I, I, I must say, Minister, you're right. And technologies from, from Philip's question here. Um, uh, is it, uh, yes, it's Philip's question about technologies. I mean, the one worry I always have about high technology and equipment is that it goes in, it does the job, and then it's not maintained and the parts aren't available. And then the next thing, it's just what we call refer to as white elephant stuck there on the ground. I saw so many of them over the years that it is important. But technology now is quite sophisticated and it is it's it's much smaller, you know, than it used to be. So you can leave the spare parts behind. You, you're right, Nora. And also, though, technology has has simplified out in lots of ways. So while the uh, initial uh, equipment might maybe needed to do a survey can be um, a, a sophisticated piece of tech, the actual equipment necessary with a solar panel attached to it, and I've seen this firsthand, mm -hmm. to enable the drilling to take place and the water to be brought can actually be done and provided in a very, very uh, in clever way that actually enables local communities uh, to be able to work and maintain that system because some other development countries which build very excessive projects in, in, in different parts of the world which aren't maintainable or aren't in the long term um, are going to be sustainable, they turn into white elephants. What we must always be conscious of in our work is that you must deliver a project that can continue to be uh, developed and implemented by the local community. Yes, indeed. Now, I have another question here, Minister, from Michael O'Brien. Uh, trends of increasing global food insecurity, the severity of climate and biodiversity crisis has become ever clearer, and you've mentioned so many of them. What opportunities does the Minister or Ireland see for advancing meaningful action on this nexus 
at COP15. I think a lot of us got a little bit confused. We thought COP in Sharm El Sheikh was the COP meeting and then the COP15 started. So you might just, I don't know whether you're intending to be there or have uh, somebody out there at COP15, but the biodiversity issue has now taken front and centre stage. Yeah, no, my colleague, I think Minister uh, Malcolm Byrne is leading on the, the, the COP15, which is the Canadian COP, if anyone has uh, has been following this. The, the biodiversity side is really, really important. One of the things that we have done in Ireland is to actually position ourselves almost ahead of a number of other countries on this, and particularly our work on food security systems. Um, a lot of work done by Tom Allen, a lot of work done by the government, a lot of work done uh, by agencies inputting into it has made some of the, the, the processes which we have as ones that are actually um, world leading and that other people are looking towards. It is really, really important uh, and probably will be at the heart of this climate argument uh, that is, people still don't, they, they, they get the general COP, they get the general emissions, whatever, but biodiversity and food security are absolutely central and we must get it right. The, the, the current approach which the developed world has is non-sustainable and the current approach to agriculture is something that, and, and this, doesn't, this doesn't limit agriculture, this just means we do things and look at how we do things in a better and different way because we continue to need agriculture to feed the population of the planet. Uh, uh, but it's how we do that in the most sustainable way uh, that food security is really going to be so important. Thank you very much. I just want to ask you um, how, how much knowledge is there now of wheat getting out of the Ukraine area? We saw it was completely blocked, but then more recently we saw ships um, managing to get through. And I just wonder if you have any up-to-date knowledge on that. And the other question I want to come back to is the COP uh, meeting in Sharm El Sheikh where this loss and damage was agreed. Now, I'm not sure I fully understand exactly how that is going to be rolled out and how countries can be first assessed as to what they're entitled to under loss and damage and which country or countries are going to fill that void for them and pay them for what they've lost and damaged. Sorry about that, but I just want to hear what you know about that. Well, no, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a very straightforward answer. The reason you don't know is because that detail is not there yet. Ah. And so what came out was the agreement in principle to move on to it, and then that we would look in detail what, what Minister Ryan wanted and what the EU wanted and what we wanted um, was some particular constraints, particularly around that the targeting of that resources goes to the most vulnerable countries, the countries that need it most, and that the principle, which is really important, um, that um, there's a recognition, which is what loss and damage is all about at its heart. Loss and damage is about the, the green, the principle that there needs to be a easy access to funds to help countries most affected by climate impact who have contributed the least and are usually in parts of the world where they are the most affected, that they would receive support and financial support and movement to them to enable them to deal with the loss and damage they suffer from the wealthier countries. That actually was a very difficult principle to get over the line. You had certain countries which started off, even in Egypt, not to mention in, in, in Scotland, with you know reparations and we don't want this and the whole lot. And that's why it's such an achievement to have got to the point we've got. There is a lot of teasing out of those details. The one thing we're focusing on is that it should be easily accessible. There's, there's a lot of climate finance provisions out there. There's a lot of talk around climate finance, but when you talk to countries that are the most vulnerable, that are the ones that are in the direst need of access uh, to the development uh, climate finance, they'll tell you it's almost impossible. It's so complex that by the time you go through the, the hoops and the rings, you know, you've experienced another climate issue disaster and you now need more funding, more funding again. So we need loss and damage to streamline that and to work and that'll come into place. And that's really at the heart of it. Um, the ships, the for wheat. Yes, that. sorry, yeah. thank you. I, I, yeah. do, I was trying to remember. What, now, yeah. two things really important to remember. The first is that the situation in Ukraine has exacerbated um, the crisis that was taking place in the Horn of Africa. Uh, it was there before it, 
and they, this has exacerbated it. Mm. Um, the program is welcome and it is, it is good that it is happening. It under no circumstances replaces the loss in what was the actual flow uh, prior to the war. Um, and therefore, uh, the World Food Programme, which will be one of the, the, the biggest recipients of um, grain coming out of, the, uh, of Ukraine, etc., will tell you that while it is helpful to have that program there we 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 need greater flows and we we need them and you know unfortunately with the way in which the program is implemented it it is limiting in what is coming out it's it's much better than nothing but it is not sufficient for what is needed um and and therein is part of the problem yeah, I know that that seems to be the, the worries a lot of people have. Can I just, we're coming near the end here, Minister, now, can I just bring you back to maybe local um, and our own society? You know, how do you, in your role as Minister for Overseas Development and the Diaspora, engage with civil society working on the ground in these humanitarian situations? Um, I'm assuming, and I know it, that you are consulting in program planning and budget allocation with the many agencies, uh, both the department itself and the agencies that are providing humanitarian assistance. But um, is, is that, have you, have you a good link of communication with these groups and NGOs? They do tremendous work. Uh, I serve myself on both the Trocra board and the concern board in my time, and I know the kind of work they're doing. But are you satisfied that there's still general popular support for the work you are doing? Uh, the very simple, quick answer to that is yes. And I think we're very lucky and it should never be taken for granted because um, it's not universal across um, European countries. It's not universal across developed countries that the level of support which exists in Ireland in terms of our work on international development, our work on humanitarian response and the amazing support which the Irish public shows to our NGOs. And our NGOs, therefore, as a result of that support, are some of the best NGOs in the world, and they punch well above their weight uh, in an international arena. And it is there because of the really positive uh, engagement at government, at NGO, and at public level in terms of the willingness to support and fund. Now, that should never be taken for granted. It's continually important that we explain and that we inform. And there are programs which we work at through the schools uh, so it's that the next generation coming up are even more aware of global citizenship and more aware of the needs and why we should be doing what we are doing. And we need always to make that case because particularly if you, if you face local economic hardship and cost of living increases and things we've all experienced here in our own country sometimes you know you always wonder will people say well then why are we doing why are we spending why would we ever want to but i always say this two things i think that have huge impact one is our own history and um you know it's a hundred just 150 odd years since our own famine and since we were the recipients of support from Choctaw Indians, from communities around the world that had such an impact on our country. And I think that still plays right the way through in terms of the willingness of Irish people and the willingness of Irish society to be general. The other thing I think is that um, as a nation and as people, uh, we are generous. We have always been generous. And when we see something that we recognize instinctively is something that should be supported. We are willing to be there and we are willing to help. I think we showed that, Nora, going all the way back to the proportionate response in Live Aid and, uh, you know, in terms of what Irish people did there, right up to the current day, when you look at our response on Ukraine or when you look at our response to other international crises, Irish people have always been willing and they've always been willing to back the Irish government of its time uh, in facing these issues uh, and in being there. And I think we just need to make sure that we keep up that um, national way of responding 
um, uh, because I think it's something as a country and as a people we can be incredibly proud of. Um, but yes, we'll always continue to work on it and always try and improve and enhance those levels of communication uh, right along between our NGOs and the department here, between myself and the NGOs, and between the communication, as I said, at the heart of it, which I think is most important, with the next generations through the school programmes that we run. Thank you very much. And I, I think it's a positive way to end when we remind ourselves of the excellent work that our NGOs are doing. I better be careful naming too many of them. I might leave some out, but I know there are small NGOs that we don't often hear about doing excellent work, but besides the concern through Goal, Christian Aid, the big ones, but there are many of them there and we must pay tribute to all of them for the work they are doing. Minister, I want to thank you most warmly and sincerely for your very comprehensive report today. And if anybody wants to share some of the information with friends and maybe they hear friends saying, oh, why are there so many people coming into Ireland and looking for asylum? Maybe they need to hear some of these facts and figures and recognize that despite the fact that we're having difficulties, perhaps housing people or getting proper accommodation, that what we're doing is only a tiny, tiny portion of the needs of many of these countries and their people. So thank you for sharing with us. We wish you continued success. I know there's going to be changes in the next week. We don't know whether we'll have you back again. <laughs> and, but the best, the best of luck to you. I have no idea. Uh, Michael Gaffey I've, no, probably, I've no idea either, by the way. <laughs> Michael Gaffey is probably listening very carefully uh, to this and, and, and wondering what, 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 what will be there next week. But Thank you most sincerely and thank you to our audience and for your questions today. Good afternoon to you all.